Now, if you jump back to page 27, we're going to pick up where Dwight left off. Uh, you've been looking at an individual that you want to help. You want to engage in their life and uh, help them be what God made them to be. When I got dumped into ministry many, many years ago, I was this kid right out of Bible college. Through Bible college, I wanted to disciple people, but the image that I had of discipleship was uh, a program. Which is the best discipleship program to buy? And uh, the programs that were available were all 8 to 12, 13 weeks, and they were about basic help some new believer come up to speed so that they're part of the church and baptized and all that kind of stuff. And uh, something just wasn't working in, in helping me to grasp what that was all about. I struggled with that. I, I landed in a church ministry, and all of a sudden I got these people around me, and I'm trying to run programs. Churches have programs. That's not a bad thing. I'm trying to run these programs, and I'm finding myself absolutely confused as to what people needed because they needed all kinds of different things. And so I'd get up and I'd preach and teach and I'd have some that thought this was really wonderful and this is exactly what I needed and others that are just gone. They don't get a thing. I'm trying to figure this thing out. The easy part is just get frustrated with those bozos that don't get it and they just don't care about the things of God and I'm going to focus on these people. But if I really am committed to helping people understand what's true about them and come to conclusions in the word. I can't be writing people off. It was in that conflict, in internal conflict in myself, that I begin to uh, I, I begin to thrash around like most good pastors do, trying to find an answer, trying to find some trek. I came across the book that intrigued me, and, um, and yet I'm reading, and I said, this is really lousy exposition of the text that he was using. But the guy was positing that maybe there was a multi-level approach to ministry, that maybe different people needed different things. Now, he was kind of ripping a text out of context and using it in a way that... Let's just put it this way. I, 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 I think he was missing the point of the text. Okay? But something stuck in my head. As I began to search the scriptures, I came across um, some... <clears throat> excuse me. I came across some passages that began to glue themselves together and, uh, and put together a concept that I had not heard before, but it resonated and um, presented itself as something that I needed to chase. Okay? So that's sort of the genesis of the thought process for me. I'm sure it's not new with me. But what I begin to understand is that in starting out, all of this stuff that Dwight has been talking about was absolutely essential. I had to go back to the fact that I've got to plug into people's lives. I have to be engaged in their lives or I'm never going to understand where they're at and what they need from me. I not only have to plug into their lives, I have to be the guy who is paying attention while I'm plugged into their lives. Now, you understand that everybody's different. Not only are they different in terms of their spiritual development, they're different in a lot of ways. And I can get myself bogged down and confused with, well, he needs this and he needs that, and. And it just gets so complicated that we don't know where to go. I begin to focus down on what God has asked us to do is not all of that stuff. He's asked us to help each other grow in Christ. And all of those things are just context. So if I can focus my attention and really pay attention to a couple of things, then that might be most helpful. I need to pay attention to what they need. And again, not what they need in all these various ways, but what do they need in order to grow in their walk with God? 
What do they need? So I'm focused on people's needs. Not on mine, not on what I need from them, but on their need. And then I'm also focused on their potential. We have a tendency in ministry to uh, figure out where we want people to be and what's lacking and so what, what needs to change about them. But, but the other side of it is, is, what do they have that God's given them that they don't realize? How do I pull that out of them? Uh, and then I need to plan for their growth. Now, that's kind of where we're going with this whole weekend, is engaging, paying attention, and helping them grow. During the weekend, we're going to cover all of that. What I want to focus on here, though, is how do I pay attention to what they need? What it is that God's doing in their life, and what are the next steps? Part of the problem is, for me, is that I tend to be this visionary who sees way out there. So I say, man, what, what it would be like if we had a church full of people who were just on fire for God and in love with God, charging into their community, and I got this huge vision, and here's somebody that just doesn't care about it or is, has got other priorities, and I begin to build a conflict with these people instead of understanding that God gave me those people just like he gave me my children and my grandchildren. They're his. And I need to take them the next steps. The end game will take care of itself. But the next steps, what are the next steps? What do they need from me? In this process, I begin to look at the idea of spiritual development. Now, this was back quite a few years ago, and again, I'm frustrated in ministry trying to work with people. And I'm seeing, uh, at that time, I was a youth pastor, and I'm trying to work with kids. They're pretty obvious, often, as to where they're at. And then I'm looking at this kid who's acting out, and I'm seeing her dad, who's a deacon, and I'm saying, I don't think he's any more spiritual than she is, and you know how that goes? So I begin to uh, try to sort that out. I came to the scripture, and it occurred to me that as I'm looking at Christ's ministry through the Gospels, um, his ministry is very multi-level. You look at Jesus' ministry, and he is, uh, throughout his ministry, working with the masses, is he not? The masses are there. He's always preaching with masses from the beginning almost to the end. So there's those people that he is calling to repentance. Uh, in that context, some people check in. These are people who I would call initiates. They check in. They want to follow after him. They respond to the message, and he begins to work with them at another level. His message to them is, come along, follow me. Engage. And then as time goes along, you've got those, that handful of people. By the end, you've got about 120 uh, that are following him. But there's another group of people that sort of formed into the 12 and plus some that were traveling around with him. But there were, were, were those people that were, we call them disciples. They were people who uh, were engaged with him in the ministry. They're followers of his. And you watch what he's teaching them. It's all about how to grow, how to expand in your walk with God, your ministry capacity. And then ultimately, even uh, uh, throughout the latter part of his ministry, he's got several guys that are in real tight with him. These are people that he's training to be reproducers. And by the end, he's putting that commission on the 12 and saying, here, go take this. Make it happen. It occurred to me as I watched Jesus' ministry that he's not doing this and then this and then this and then this, but there's this process in which people are being drawn along to a, a graduated process of discipleship. Now, in the Gospels, it never really nails down in any detail exactly how that evaluation is done and how Jesus decided when somebody was ready to move further. You get some hints of it. 
Then I came across, um, I'm, I'm looking at Paul. I'm saying, okay, Jesus did this, but Jesus' ministry is uh, technically pre-church age, and it's, uh, maybe there's another system going on there. What does it look like in the church? And I begin to look at the epistles, see what Paul was doing. We're going to zero in on uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 2, and the first paragraph of chapter 3, and you might want to look at that. We're going to uh, cover an awful lot of territory here. Uh, by the way, you have a lot of scriptures listed in your text, and we're not going to have time to do any justice to any of them. You could spend a lot of time on each of those scriptures. <clears throat> what I do want to suggest to you, though, is as we walk through these stages of spiritual development, as we've mapped them out from the scripture, uh, you always hold a system in suspicion. Fair? A system that has been placed over the scripture, and you need to go back and really study this. I will say this. Uh, Dwight indicated this before. This tends to be the piece of what we do that is most counterintuitive, most, uh, wow, I'm not sure about this, and yet the piece that people come back time and time again and say this was the most valuable thing we did. All we're going to try to do is look at the scripture and see what does spiritual development look like and are there some benchmarks that I can put on this process so that I can figure out what this person needs to take the next steps of spiritual development. What it can do for us is demystify the process so that when somebody responds in a certain way, we get it and we're able to, uh, to uh, provide the uh, help that they need. <clears throat> the first Corinthians text that we're going to go into, by the way, is um, interesting in that what Paul does in that text is he first differentiates between the natural person and the spiritual person. In other words, the person who has no relationship with God and the person who has a spiritual capacity. He makes that differentiation in chapter 1 and 2. And... Um, it's a very interesting conversation, one that you ought to spend a pile of time just reading through and understanding the argument that Paul is making. And then in chapter 3, the first paragraph, he throws another thought in there and he says, yeah, brothers, these are saved people. I couldn't speak unto you as unto spiritual. Okay, he's just been talking about spiritual capacity versus no spiritual capacity. And now he says, you, your brothers, apparently you've got that spiritual capacity, but I couldn't talk to you that way because you're still babies in Christ. And he uses the word carnal. What we did was we just uh, built our categories off of that using the uh, words that are used in the text. Now, the more modern texts use different terminologies, but it's basically the natural person, the carnal person, the spiritual person. What we're going to do is look at each of those and then another that is not spoken of in 1 Corinthians but I think is intimated elsewhere in the scripture. And what I want to do is just walk through each of those one by one. Now I will say this, some of you are not so linear, you need to see a whole chart. If you go back to page 31, it's all there in chart form. So. Whichever way you prefer to do it, you can go through the notes or you can look at the chart. It's all the same. I kind of tend to be one of those chart type people that likes to see everything in its context. So, Dan. Dan is an angry young man. He's got good reason to be angry. Life has not been good for Dan. He's out of a terrible family situation. When I met Dan, clearly he has little to no comprehension of the scripture, nor does he care to have that. He's seething in hatred toward his father and toward most of the world. Has no testimony of salvation. 
I'm assuming he doesn't know God, he's natural. At the same time, I'm working with Rob. Rob's a good kid, been in church all his life. He likes being there. He enjoys the time together. He's pretty good with Bible quizzing. He's very well versed in the scriptures. His parents have made sure of this. No trouble. But he doesn't seem to resonate with the, with the intent of scripture in his life. It just doesn't go anywhere. When uh, something draws him aside, uh, and, and all kinds of things could easily attract him aside, and he's confronted with a word, it just doesn't go anywhere. He says he's saved. Said a prayer when he was five. Does he know God? Does he not know God? Shining the light of the word into his eyes and the pupils don't seem to dilate. Ah, something doesn't seem right here. It's a very different person externally than Dan. Yet I'm looking at these two and there are some common factors that are spoken of in the scriptures. If I look at the natural person in the scriptures... Again, starting out of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, where Paul draws the differentiation between the spiritual person and the natural person. He says, a natural person does not understand the things of the Spirit of God. Now, I like to think of natural like this, all natural. No additives, no preservatives. The guy's just got what he's born with, okay? Okay. Dan was clearly just what he was born with, with a whole bunch of messy stew mixed into it. Rob seemed to be a guy who was just what he was born with, with a lot of religious stew mixed into it. But at the core, the same characteristics seemed to be there. So what are those characteristics? Well, the first thing, and by the way, you will see as we walk through these that there are three sets of characteristics for each of the levels of spiritual development. And if you look at the chart, you can kind of see that each of those, um, the, the first characteristic in each, has to do with the relationship of this person to the Word of God. When the Word of God enters their space, what happens? The second characteristic of each is their relationship with God. And the third is their relationship with sin and righteousness. Now, the reason we do it that way is because those seem to be the dipsticks that Scripture continually uses to measure where a person's at. As I go through the Scriptures and seek to understand the difference between uh, any two uh, levels of spiritual development, those three things seem to consistently be the indicators. So, in relationship to the Word of God, the natural man you just there's no light. You can shine the light of the gospel into their eyes, they just don't see it. I have a brother who is this way. He grew up in the same household I did. He doesn't know God. You shine the light in, he does not know God. He knows the scriptures extremely well, but he still cruises through the scriptures um, seeking to uh, argue it down doesn't know God. There's no light coming, penetrating into his life from the scriptures. And you can see that elsewhere. Second Corinthians, Paul says, the God of this world has blinded the minds of those that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine in unto them. Uh, John 10, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. You don't hear my voice, you're not mine. And you can see that all the way through. Jesus uh, actually throws that out on a number of occasions. The John chapter 8 passage is interesting because here he says, <clears throat> he's talking to a group of people that had all checked in. They, 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 they were ready to sign the decision cards. He had just downplayed or, or out-argued uh, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, and they're all ready to join his camp. And he says to them, if you continue in my word, then you really are my disciples. 
And you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The Word of God will begin to transform your life. By the end of that passage, they're all mad at him. What do you mean change our lives? We don't need any change, right? And he ends up saying to the same people, you're your father, the devil, just like your dad. So in relationship to the Word of God, the natural person doesn't get it. You shine the light of the Word into their eyes, nothing happens. In relationship to sin and righteousness, or excuse me, in relationship to God, there's no evidence of a real relationship with God. It's just no evidence. Well, what would a relationship with God look like? Uh, Dwight was talking earlier about some passages where these guys are saying, well, we do this and this and this and this, and Jesus is saying you're doing that and that and that and that for yourself, not for God. There's no relationship with God. Again, you go back to the scriptures. Hebrews chapter 12 is interesting because there uh, the writer is saying there's no evidence that God has a relationship with you because God chastens his kids. If you're not getting any chastening, you're not his kid. The other passage we have down is an indicator that, in fact, we have a relationship with God. Um, John chapter 5. Now, this is an interesting one, and I want to spend just a minute here. Jesus, again, is talking to some religious leaders who have been arguing with him. And he says to them, you know what? You search the scriptures. You search the scriptures. These were Bible scholars. But he said, those same scriptures that you search, you you search the scriptures thinking that in searching them, you're okay that the activity of doing Bible study is all that it takes. But he says, those same scriptures are speaking about me, and you can't come to me that you might have life. Now, it's a very interesting conversation that we don't have time to go into in detail. Let me just say this. He ends up by saying, how can you believe who receive your honor one from another and not the honor that comes from God? What's he saying? Your relationships are lateral. You go to the scripture to impress other people. You you do your religious activity in order to maintain your relationships with other religious people. The honor that you're receiving is this way, not the honor that comes from God. An indicator. Now, let me take this back. Well, there's there's the third characteristic. There's no conviction of sin, and obviously some of this overlaps because the Hebrews 12 text, again, is about conviction of sin. A relationship with God says that he is convicting me. He is the one that's disciplining me. If there's no conviction of sin, there's no relationship. There's no life there. Now, let me say this. Before I ever came to know Christ, I felt badly, often, about things I did. Is that conviction of sin? Mm, Probably not the way he's talking about it. I feel badly because I uh, compromised my relationship with somebody or somebody's going to be mad at me or whatever. But this sense that I have sinned before a holy God, that I am in deep trouble, is the characteristic that I think he talks about here. So you've got the Hebrews text. Of course, all through 1 John, this same theme keeps coming up, where he says things like, if we say we have no sin, we're just lying. Right? And God is not in us. The Matthew 23 text is an interesting one because here Jesus is saying to these religious people, guys, guys, you're missing the entire point. This is the, where he talks about whited sepulchers and so forth. Read through that entire passage sometime because he's talking to, very, he's talking to the robs of the world and saying, you know what? You think you're okay, but you're missing the point entirely. Now, let me put all that together. There are people like Dan in our worlds that clearly do not know God. 
There are also people that have grown up in the church all their lives and may have been there for decades. They played the game very well. They're not trying to be deceitful. They just never have met the real living God, and religion has somehow anesthetized them to their sense of need for him. Fair? So what would it look like for me to take these passages and lay them over lives and seek to understand, does this person even know God? This is not some sort of um, judgment to see if I'm going to somehow shun you. But supposing I give you the benefit of the doubt and I say, well, okay, let's just assume that they know God and we'll treat them as though they're Christians. Am I helping you at all? Remember what Jesus said to the Pharisees when he said, you cover land and sea trying to make one convert and when you succeed, you make them threefold a child of hell. What's he saying? Now they're not only lost, but they think they're okay. And that's a whole lot worse. You see, Dan was in a much better position than Rob was. We'll come back and talk about what we do with each of these. But let's move ahead. I spent a bunch of time on natural because this is one that we really need to think through carefully and one that gets muddied very easily in church environments. Carnal. What does it mean to be a carnal person? The word has been used in such a pejorative manner that uh, we tend to draw back from it. The word literally just means fleshly or meatly. Carnal comes from carnas, which is the Latin from which we get carne, which is meat. That's why I call him the meathead. This is a person who apparently, according to the scriptures, has come to Christ. He has the life of Christ in him, but he's still operating out of the raw material. I think of Terry. Terry's a guy who grew up in the church clearly showed signs of life. There's conviction of sin. There's, there's a sense of, of um, what do I say, uh, that relationship with God. He's responding to the word. But, man, you start pushing him on issues of righteousness, and he just has this massive gag reflex. You know, it's like, yeah, but I don't see what's wrong with him. What about, and you know, those kinds of argumentations. He'd been that way for a long, long time. Dan had come to Christ. Still struggling with anger. Boy, he gets ticked off easily. But he's hungry for the word. He's sucking up everything he can get. But again, you try to help him think through how to interact with his dad, and it's pretty dicey. I mean, he needs a lot of hand-holding. Clearly, Dan had come to faith in Jesus Christ and was struggling and striving to grow to somehow get his hands around what this newfound faith was all about. Terry had been saved for a long time. But there was a lot of commonality between Dan and Terry. Very different people, very different circumstances. Good church kid, well-versed in the scriptures, etc. But both of them struggled with issues of righteousness, struggled with getting their heads around um, certain pieces of the scripture that just seemed to not connect with them. Let me walk you through what the text says about this person who is a baby in Christ. There's different language used in different texts, but we'll, for our sake, call him the carnal person. In relationship to the Word of God, this is a person that needs milk, not meat. Now, you'll see in all three of those characteristics a milk, not meat, this, not that, that, not that, okay? 
the idea is this is a conflicted person. There's this life of God in them that is drawing them along, but at the same time, they're tied to the flesh. And that sets up this massive conflict in their lives. When I see conflictedness in a person's life, I, I, I'm, I, I'm confident that there's some uh, life of God there. When I see no conflictedness, that worries me because this person probably doesn't know God. So in relationship to the Word of God, he needs milk, not meat. Now this is uh, one we need to spend a few minutes on because I always heard the idea of milk and meat, but the way it was presented, I, I came to discover wasn't really quite biblical. So let me try to lay this out for you. In the text... 1 Corinthians chapter 3, where he says, Are you not carnal? One of the reasons I know you're carnal is because you gag on the meat. You need milk. He doesn't really tell us what milk is and what meat is. But he does go on to these people that he's called carnal and gives us the rest of the book. And the rest of the book is all about all these petty things that they're arguing about. And he'll say, Now you're fussing over this. And he will respond to that surface issue and try to take them back to the deeper truth. And then he'll take another surface issue and take them back to the deeper truth. Now, it's sort of interesting to watch that, but what really helped me was the Hebrews text. In Hebrews chapter 5 and 6, very similar language is used. The last paragraph of chapter 5, the first paragraph of 6, it's actually one thought process. We don't have time to go through that in detail, but let me say this. As you read the text in Hebrews, what he seems to make clear is that these people also were people who could not handle the meat of the word. They still needed milk, and therefore he said, you are still babies in Christ. He doesn't use the carnal word, but the same imagery of, of spiritual infancy. Only here he tells us what meat is that they're gagging at. He says to them, you could not bear the meat of the word, the issues of righteousness. He talks about the meat as those considerations of righteousness. Now, I always thought of meat as the deeper doctrines of the word, right? So you get people's lives cleaned up as soon as they get saved, and then you can take them on to the deeper doctrines of the word. But here it seems as though what he says is that the milk of the word, you go into chapter 6, are the foundational elements of the doctrines of Christ. So, so maybe some of this doctrine is milk. Let me tell you what I think he's saying, and you go back and plow through it. The milk, that thing that the infant needs is to begin to bathe themselves in the concept of who is this Jesus and who am I in him. He talks about issues of eternality, thinking about what's coming as opposed to what's just here. He talks about thinking differently about what's righteous and what's not righteous. He talks about those kinds of things in that Hebrews 6 passage. The principal elements of the doctrines of Christ who is this Jesus and who am I in him? In a way that it changes the way that I think. It changes my orientation. Then, as that is solidified, I build the ability to ask questions of, well, what's real righteousness and what isn't? So, in relationship to the word of God, the uh, infant in Christ, the carnal person, is going to gag on issues of righteousness. It's not going to get it. They need milk. So when I see a person gagging, it does imply that they're taking in food. That's a good sign. <coughs> but they're not getting it. What's a gag look like? Well, according to these texts, it often looks like legalism. And what is legalism? The idea that I have standards in my life? That's not legalism. The idea of legalism is that somehow God is surely going to accept me because I meet these standards, right? 
an inverse sort of legalism that believes the same thing is that idea that oh, I don't see anything wrong with that. God doesn't say I can't do that, so get off my case. Okay? Both sides are saying the same thing, that righteousness, relationship with God, is bound up in a set of rules. Okay? That gag reflex that comes over issues of righteousness uh, in the scripture would indicate that I've got a person who is an infant in Christ, and what they need is different than somebody who's more mature. They need the milk of the word. Uh, in relationship to God, the relationship is very self-centered. It's about me. It's not about him. Can you all remember this? Young in the faith. and Just listen to your prayers. It's all about what I need, what I need, what I need. Daddy, can you get it? Daddy, can we? Daddy, can we? Can we get this? Can you get me that? That kind of thing. You know, kind of like a little kid. That's cute for a while. Right? That's where we expect a new believer to be. But we grow past that. So, a uh, relationship with God is very self-centered. Again, you'll see that whole thing in uh, the First Corinthians text where he's talking about, are you not carnal? Are you jealousy and strife? It's all about you. And, and why would I be a Paul or of Apollos? Because I need to be part of a group, and that group needs to be the winning group. It's a very self-centered sort of approach. Uh, James 1 talks about it, about it as sort of a double-mindedness. God is injecting things in your life, and you're complaining about it. Why? Because that double-mindedness is there. You want God engaged in your life, but there's certain things that you need God to pay attention to, uh, and so forth. Then there's the whole relationship with sin and righteousness. You see how these all interconnect. Um, Galatians 5 really is a, an interesting place to go because there he talks about the fruits of the flesh, fruits of the spirit. But he starts that whole conversation off by saying this. You want to walk in the spirit? Or, or you, want, you want to avoid the... the, the fruits of the flesh. You don't want to walk in the flesh and then walk in the spirit. If you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And then he goes on and he talks about those characteristics or those deeds that come out of your flesh and those deeds that come out of the spirit. It's a very interesting contrast. What he's not saying is get these off your checklist and put these on your checklist and then you'll be spiritually saying, no, no, no. You walk in the Spirit, and this is what will come out of that relationship with the Spirit. You walk in the flesh, and this is where the flesh will take you. So the idea here is that when it comes to sin and righteousness, the carnal person is, um, tends to see that whole thing from a legalistic perspective. What have I done? And again, remember, look at any little kid. They are born legalists, and they'll argue with you over what you actually told them, what you didn't tell them, and, but I did this, and you know how that goes? We, we do that with God. That's the classic carnal person. Now let me go back to Dan. Dan had a hard time with issues of righteousness early on because he was under extreme circumstances. But his task was to get his head around the fact that God had given him his spirit to live there, to produce righteousness in him. But still, he's trying to somehow pay God back by producing it himself. And he was having a struggle. Terry, on the other hand, isn't even struggling with it. He just kind of assumes that that's what Christianity is about, is, is producing this stuff for God. And so it's this constant negotiation. But the same things are in common. He's got the same relationship with the Word. He's got the same relationship with God. He's got the same relationship with sin and righteousness. The difference is that Terry's just sitting there accepting that as the norm, and Dan is driving past it. But what do they need? They really kind of need the same set of things, don't they? 
in order to grow up in Christ to a point where they can thrive. The third person, spiritual person. Again, we use this term in a way that sort of confutes the meaning, I think. Uh, we tend to use it sort of in uh, some kind of a pompous way, I'm spiritual, and then it gets turned around to, oh, you're just so spiritual, as sort of a pejorative, right? Because so often we think of spiritual and carnal as somehow, I'm really good and you're not. But if I think about this from spiritual development, we understand that we are all a very, very long way away from what God has intended us to be or is taking us toward. So really, all we're talking about here is not somebody who is fully furnished unto all good works, somebody that is, is, has arrived. We're talking more about, uh, in spiritual terms, sort of the adolescent. You remember, in physical terms, you got the baby who is just really needing to be taken care of and fed milk and so forth. And then you come into a time in your life where you're kind of self-feeding. You're able to really uh, go through that massive growth spurt that takes you from childhood to adulthood, a more independent state. That's really what I'm seeing, I think, in the scripture as far as this idea of spiritual. Now, going back to the 1 Corinthians text, he's going to talk us through spiritual as it compares to the natural person and then uh, see it as somebody who, is, who has really gotten there as opposed to the person who's an infant trying to get there. So, the spiritual person. Here's Linda. Linda grew up in a Christian home. Uh, some tough shots, but she had a mother who really loved God, trained her well. She's a sweet, sweet girl. And from the time I met her all the way through uh, she's now in her 50s and has been through that time just a exuding and excited relationship with God from a young age. Growing, having an influence on people. But back at this time, she's relatively new to that. Man, she'll suck up anything you can get her. She's handling the meat. She's going into the word. She's feeding herself. She's coming in with all kinds of questions and interacting with people, influencing them. The perfect kid to have in your youth group. The perfect kind of people to have out in the pews. And then there's Dan. Dan by now has been saved about a year at the most. He's been striving and struggling, and he's in this awful set of circumstances, but he begins to not need to be picked up and dusted off every time he hits a road bump. And now the questions aren't, man, my dad did this, and I'm just ready to tear his head off, and that sort of thing. It's, wow, I saw this. This is really cool. How do I, how do I make full use of this? How do I... It's, a, it's an entirely different thing. He's a self-feeder. A lot of differences between Dan and Linda, but there are some commonalities in relationship to the Word. Both of them are people who are taking in the meat of the Word. They get it. There's that spiritual wisdom that uh, Paul talks about in chapter 2 chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians <clears throat> where you know the, the world has this worldly wisdom but then there's this spiritual wisdom and it seems as though what he's saying in the text is this uh, comparing it to the 2 Corinthians text where the God of this world has blinded the minds of those that believe not these people the blinders are gone they're able to see beyond what the natural human being can see You ever talk to people that don't know God and they just cannot understand the hope that is in you, the confidence that you have? And when you think about what they see, which is just what's there physically, you understand that. But they don't know God. They've never seen God. 
There's a whole segment of reality, a, a universe of reality that is beyond the capacity of the human mind as it is born to ever comprehend. And yet God turns on the lights. The light of the glorious gospel of Christ shines into our hearts in the face of Jesus Christ. And he is alive. Think of Paul on the road to Damascus. Here's this guy breathing out threats and slaughter, absolutely convinced that he was serving God by wiping these people out. And he meets Jesus face to face. And there is a whole new reality. Right? You remember the day the lights turned on for you? But you remember that early on, that was kind of a conflicted struggle. What, what, what's all this mean, right? And then you get to that place where you begin to see it. The word begins to unfold in your life. You begin to struggle through it on your own. You're able to see things. You're able to feed. You're able to listen to somebody preach and teach. And uh, it, it makes sense to you. You don't have to have them spoon-feeding you and telling you what to do. So, in relationship to the Word of God, there's an ear toward the Word. I'm listening. I'm proactively, intentionally seeking out the truth. In relationship to God, it's a whole different relationship. It's not that little kid now, Daddy, would you, Daddy, would you, Daddy, give me, that kind of thing. It's now this relationship that, that has a heart that, that longs for God, a heart that is seeking after relationship that is growing between me and God. You see that played out in a number of places in Scripture. Uh, again, the First Corinthians text where he says, we have the mind of Christ. There's this this connection. Uh, John 10, my sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. There's that desire to follow after God. A relationship with God. Now, there are many, many scriptures that speak of this, and I would encourage you to, to take that a whole lot further, but you kind of see where we're going with this? The relationship's not about me. It's now about chasing after God, wanting to grow and expand in my understanding of who he is. And in relationship to sin and righteousness, now it's not this legalistic, what can I, what can't I? It's about a relationship. It's about that relationship with God. I want to please him. I don't want anything to compromise my relationship with God. Why would I go to that? Why would I do that when it's going to hurt him? When it's going to hurt my ability to have a relationship with him? I really love the Philippians 3 text. In contrast to uh, the earlier part of the text where Paul says, I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, I was a Jew of the Jew, I kept all the laws, I, 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 my own righteousness. He says, but what things were gained to me, those I count loss. Yea, doubtless I count everything but loss. For what? To be all that he made me to be. To have that, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings. I want to know him. It's not about, can I get away with this? It's not about, is there a rule against this? It's about, what will help me to know God? You see the difference? Both Dan and Linda are there. Totally different circumstances, totally different backgrounds but they're both chasing after this relationship with God. It looks very different because Dan's coming at it as this raw, young uh, believer who, is, who can't understand why everybody wouldn't be this way. Kind of opening his mouth and uh, spitting fire at times at those crazy people around him that don't 
care about the things of God and all of that. Linda's far more gentle and understands those people because she had been there. But they're both in the same place in terms of their relationship with God. The uh, fourth level is not found in the First Corinthians text. I think there's a good reason for that because Paul's talking to carnal people there. And typically, you will see God taking us the next steps, not two steps down the road. He just takes us the next steps. Fair? In the Gospels, the primary message of the Gospels is to lost people, and he's just taking them to salvation. And then in 1 Corinthians and Hebrews, both, where he says, you're just babies in Christ, he's trying to get them to the next step. What we began to notice early on was, as we begin to look at uh, ministry in terms of uh, gradations of growth, that there seemed to be something beyond the spiritual person. And uh, in the scriptures, you find that primarily in the pastoral epistles, where Paul is talking to people who are uh, making full proof of their ministry. It's another level, it seems. Um, The terminology is unfortunate because I'm not here talking about somebody who is spiritual who also is a natural leader. There are a lot of those people around, and I love having them. They're great to work with. But we're not talking about that. What we're talking about is people who, by their nature, are now at a place where their life is not about their own growth only. It's this this need in them to drag others along. This desire to see the life of Christ fully formed in everybody that they know. That, That sort of sense. Scott was a kid who... uh, quite young, became a a real spiritual leader. He was out front. He was, he had always been a natural leader, but, um, and, and, and positive. But he came to that point where the seriousness in his heart defined him as a person who was there to be used by God. Dan, a couple of years into his walk with God, became a spiritual leader. He was not a natural leader. In fact, he was a bit bombastic and tended to bury people often. But there came about him this need, this self-definition that was about, hey, God saved me for his purposes, and I am here for people. I'm here for God to use me in the lives of the people around me. Both of those young men had a huge impact on the world around them, both saved and unsaved. God used them in a mighty way and continues to do that. But while they were very different people, there's a strong commonality. And again, if I go back to the pastorals, and we've touched on some other places, because you see, for instance, in the Gospels, Jesus making these kinds of statements with, uh, or having these kind of conversations with people. But essentially what you find in relationship to the Word, that now we have a relationship with the Word that is about bearing fruit. Now, that, that doesn't mean that the person isn't still growing in their own walk with God and still uh, seeking to to expand that relationship with God. But now, it seems as though the the emphasis or the, the next step is, I want to have a ministry of the Word into the lives of people. I want the Word of God to flow through me in a highly effective manner. And I think that's what you'll see in these texts. I love the second... Timothy text, because Paul, talking to this young man, says, 
he, he's talking about raising up leaders. And, and, and we like this verse when we talk about bibliology, right? The power of the Word of God. The Word of God is quick, it's alive, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, those kinds of conversations. But here he says that the Word of God is the breath of God breathed out. The life of God breathed out onto the pages of a book, and it is profitable for doctrine, which is profitable for reproof. In other words, you hear, you understand the teaching of the Word. It reproves you, it corrects you, and it instructs you in righteous living. So that, and here's the end goal, this is where I see the spiritual leader. So that the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Could I re retranslate it this way? So that the man of God might be fully mature and thoroughly furnished. Fully mature does not intimate that there's no room to grow. It means full adulthood. Okay? He comes to full adulthood and he is completely furnished to everything that God saved him to be. I have seen dynamic spiritual leaders in this rite who were very quiet, never up front, but their lives move the lives of people around them toward God. Um, John 15, he talks about the vine and the branches. It's all about bearing fruit. And again, he's talking to these guys right before he's going to launch them into a spiritual leadership ministry. Uh, in relationship to God, it's about being a follower of God in his way. I am related to God not just so that I am gaining benefit and I am growing. This beautiful relationship with God becomes a means of following him where he's going and where is he going? He's on a redemptive mission, a transformative mission in the lives of people. And I get to be part of that with him. You just watch Paul remonstrate often through the New Testament about just the wonder of being allowed to be part of that, that cause. And I think that's what you see in Philippians chapter 3. I follow after if that I may be everything that he saved me to be. The third thing is that um, in regard to sin and righteousness, now I'm a fellow laborer with Christ. Now I like this, and I'm just going to use one of these passages. In Romans, Paul is talking to a bunch of people that I think are spiritual people. He comes down to the end of the book and he's talking to them about a variety of issues that need to be dealt with. One of them is the issue of meats offered to idols and the, the controversy that was there as to whether or not that was a, appropriate. And I love what he says because he sorts that whole thing out with them and helps them consider it from a biblical perspective, but I love this. Here's the spiritual leaders. Guys, you know, if I have to say, I could eat meat all day long, no matter where it's been, not a big deal. But you know what? I would be a vegetarian till the day I die if you needed that from me. I could do that for you. Because it's not about what I get to do, what's right and what's not right. It's about you following after God because my role in this world I'm a servant of God. My job as a servant of God, help you be everything God wants you to be. Now, you ask me to be a vegetarian? That's not a pretty request. And yet he's saying, that's the spiritual leader. It's not about, uh, is this technically right or not right? It's what does, what do you need from me? in order for God to work his purposes in your life. That's a spiritual leader. And very young, I saw that in both Scott and in Dan. Now, we've talked about four different levels. 
obviously levels are somewhat arbitrary, just like when does a person become not an infant and now they're a toddler, I don't know. They kind of slide into it, right? <clears throat> but to whatever degree it's helpful for us to organize this, that's, that's, that's good. Now let me show you very quickly, if you go back to page 31, because this is important. You see on the top of that chart the diagnosis. That's what we've been talking about. But what do each of these people need from you? What are the implications in how you're going to help them? I'm just going to give you a short sketch here for just a few minutes and see if we can make some sense out of this. What needs to happen for the um, natural person? Well, if they don't know God, all they need is to know God. I'm not trying to help clean up their lives and get them to stop this sin and that sin. That's not going anywhere. They need to know God. So I got a person in my church and I'm saying, man, I'm not sure this person knows God. Maybe this is, maybe this is one of those people that thinks they do, but they don't. What do I do? I shift my approach from trying to get them to clean up their lives. And it's all about me going into their lives like Jesus goes to the well or goes to Nick's house, right? It's about jumping into their lives, engaging with them, and seeking to bring Jesus Christ to them. That's all, right? Carnal person, I think this person's a babe in Christ. What do they need from me? Well, at this point now, I'm engaging them with me. I'm helping them to take those first steps. I'm kind of spoon-feeding them in the Word, right? A lot of application, quick turnarounds of here's the problem, here's the truth, here's how it works, that kind of thing. But in the process, slowly I'm putting their hand on the spoon, right? And helping them take those first steps. Uh, if I got a person who's spiritual, well, now I'm engaging them in higher levels of ministry. I'm fanning the flame as they're going to the Word. I'm helping them troubleshoot some things. But it's a far more independent sort of approach. Fair? And what am I doing with the spiritual leader? Man, I'm giving them everything I can and spinning them out there, letting them make full proof of their ministry. Uh, one way that's, uh, in my mind, a bit easier to understand all this. If you think about, in the scriptures, what books of the New Testament are written to natural people? You don't usually think about it this way, right? But if you think about it, the Gospels are Gospel tracts, right? They were written with one message. Now, you can get all kinds of good stuff out of the Gospels, right? But the primary message of the Gospels is, who is this Jesus? And what do you have to do with him? So what do you do with natural people? Well, the content of the Gospels is the content that you want. These are the people that I'm walking through the book of John. Because every chapter, every passage in the book of John confronts you with, who is this Jesus? Are you for real? Are you for real? You really got life in you? Okay? So think about the Gospels. If they are written to natural people, the content of the Gospels is Jesus. That's it. Who is this Jesus and who are you? And the approach of the Gospels is a narrative. And what did we say? You bring Jesus into the lives of people, but it's all a narrative. You're bringing your life to them, and you're letting them see Jesus work through your life. They need to because they don't have the capacity to understand the things of the Spirit of God. They need to see God in your life. They need to see him working through you. So think about the Gospels as sort of the template as to how I work with natural people, carnal people. Well, books of the New Testament are written to carnal people. Well, clearly, 1 Corinthians is, because he says so. Hebrews is, he says so. Let me suggest that probably 2 Corinthians, Galatians, James, 
would fit that same sort of model. And what do they do? Instead of throwing out piles of spiritual truth for you to process on your own, they all go to individual situations, solve those situations from the word, and in doing so, help people learn how to begin to eat. It's the basic principles. You're struggling with this in your flesh. Okay, so now let's think about this differently. How does this relate to your walk with Jesus Christ? And you watch. You just go through the book of 1 Corinthians. That's what he does on one issue after another, after another, after another. He starts with the realities in their lives, and he brings those realities to Jesus. And what difference does it make when I see them in the, in the equation of who Jesus is and what Jesus is doing in my life? That's it. So that's a high-intensity relationship. It's a model for how do I live, how do I work with these people, and what is the content that they need, the milk, what does it look like? Spiritual people. I might suggest that Romans, Ephesians, Philippians, Galatians, uh, First and Second Thessalonians, those kinds of books are all written to people who are at a level of maturity where they're able to, you watch in every one of those books, what does he do? He lays out in Romans 11 chapters of phenomenal heavy-duty doctrine, and then he applies it in a few chapters, right? Ephesians is sort of three chapters, three chapters. But he lays out the truth because these are people that are able to take in the truth and process it into action. Interestingly, much of what we tend to do in ministry is that, and we wonder why so few people get it, because so few people have gotten there in their walk with God. Okay? Spiritual leaders, what does he do? Well, you look at the pastoral epistles. A lot less doctrinal content that's a, that, that is all assumed in those books, and it's a lot more about how do I help this person make full proof of his ministry? How do I help him apply it to that sort of spiritual leadership? Now, most of us are going to be uh, looking at the target people we're working with, and I'm going to guess that the majority are carnal according to this. Some will be spiritual. Some you'll figure out, mm, probably don't know God. What we're going to ask you to do in the breakout is um, uh, if you look at page 32, do a quick preliminary diagnosis. I'm not going to go through all those steps. It's pretty clear. Essentially what you're doing is you're looking at the person that you're thinking about and asking yourself over against these various uh, categories that we've talked through, what am I seeing? Now, don't press this, just first impressions, okay? Because if you say somebody's natural and they're actually saved, you haven't hurt them, okay? They're not going to hell just because you said so. You don't have that power. It's not going to hurt. I, I just want you to first, just from what you know right now, don't take too much time. Just do it. Okay? The idea is the exercise because it will help you think differently about that person in your further contact with them. Rule of thumb number two. If I'm saying, man, I'm not sure if this person's saved or not saved, put them in natural. Not sure if this person's carnal or spiritual, put them in carnal. Why would I say that? Okay, let me give you one illustration. Many years ago, Ben... I got a phone call. He had uh, been playing football with some friends without pads in somebody's backyard. And when I went and picked him up, his shoulder was over here. Okay? Well, I look at it, and uh, although he wouldn't let me touch it, he had his hand firmly grasping it. He wouldn't let me touch it. So. I look at it and say, well, either he broke his clavicle really good or his shoulder's dislocated. Now, without going into all the details, any of you with any medical moxie know that if I assumed that it was the dislocation and I did what you do to relocate a shoulder and it was really a broken clavicle, I could do a lot of damage. On the other hand, if I assume it's a clavicle, and I do what you do to fix a clavicle, I'm not going to hurt anything if I'm wrong. Same principle applies here. Let's give him the benefit of that. Let's just say he's saved. 
That's not good. If I'm going to be wrong, I'm going to be wrong on the, on the right side. Okay? So I always diagnose down if I'm not sure. Now, you're going to do that very quickly. And then what I'm asking you to do is look at yourself. You will never diagnose others well if you're not diagnosing yourself. Fair? Do that. And uh, hover in your groups. By the way, those of you that aren't attached to a group, just attach yourself to a group near you. Uh, and your group leaders are going to uh, take different initiatives here and handle you in different ways. That's fine. They know you better than I. Uh, to help you process this together. So some groups may uh, do exercise one, talk about it, exercise two, talk about it, some of you, uh, however you want to do it, okay? Group leaders, do that however you see best. When are we done with that, Ben? We're going to go uh, at quarter till. Okay, so we got uh, 32 minutes by my watch. Uh, and, and then just follow through the discussion. Here's the deal. This is hard work. This is some of the hardest work you will do this weekend. Work hard at it. Uh, by the by, in the back of your book, uh, in the appendices, there is an interesting piece that we put in here, the last one on page 58, uh, self-evaluation. That really, if you read through that, it takes the principles we're talking about. And if that's helpful to you, use it. Okay. Uh, somebody that was at a conference like this some time ago, Don Chapin, put that together, and I like it. Uh, so if that's helpful to you, use it. Don't let it confuse you. But Okay, any questions on the assignment? All right, let's do it. Rule number three, have fun with it.